This video is sponsored by Brilliant. As I'm sure pretty much everyone watching this knows, regular trig goes hand in hand with the unit circle, which has an equation of x squared plus y squared equals 1. Plot a point cosine of theta comma sine theta, and that point will guaranteed lie somewhere on that circle. Then as we sweep the input angle, that point simply moves around the circle. Now hyperbolic trig seems completely unrelated at first. Hyperbolic cosine involves adding two exponential terms and dividing by two, and hyperbolic sine is just about the same, but with a minus sign on the numerator. However, this time, hyperbolic trig and these expressions go hand in hand with a hyperbola that has the equation x squared minus y squared equals one. But they go together in the same way. If we plot hyperbolic cosine comma hyperbolic sine of some input, which is really just the same as plotting this here with that input of 0.5 in the exponents, then the point will lie on the hyperbola. And as we change that input, the point simply moves along our curve. So there's one way trig and hyperbolic trig are actually much more related than they first appear. And when we move to the world of calculus, we see something similar. We know for the function y equals e to the x, it has the property where the derivative equals itself. Nothing changes. And of course, e to the x satisfies this differential equation. For the function sine and cosine, they have the property where the second derivative equals the negative of the original function. The second derivative of sine of x is negative sine of x, for example. And these functions satisfy this differential equation. Well, hyperbolic sine and cosine are almost the same and just add more to this picture. They both have the property where the second derivative is the same as the original function, and these hyperbolic functions satisfy this differential equation. Now, probably the most famous equation of this form is that which describes a mass on a spring with no friction. The force of the spring is minus kx, and that equals ma, or m times the second derivative of position. The solution to this is a simple sine or cosine curve as the block just oscillates back and forth with no decay. And the negative is here because force is opposite of displacement. You try to push the spring in and it will push back the other way. However, if somehow we had a spring which did the opposite, like when you pulled it to the right, the spring applied the same magnitude of force, kx, in the same direction and just caused the block to accelerate to the right forever, then we'd model it with this equation, just the same with a positive kx, and this matches the differential equation we see here, so the solution would be a hyperbolic cosine or sine curve. It wouldn't be parabolic like a constantly accelerating rocket, and it wouldn't be purely exponential like this, but it would be close. It would actually approach the exponential curve as an asymptote. All right, that's not a real application, but at least in school, I only learned that, hey, it's called hyperbolic trig because it has trig-like properties, such as the derivative of sine is cosine, and the derivative of hyperbolic sine is hyperbolic cosine. Cool, but hopefully you can see that there are more meaningful properties just in regards to the mathematics of hyperbolic trig. But now let's get to some real applications. The most famous example, which I've discussed before, is the catenary curve. When a cable or rope hangs between two fixed points and is only acted upon by gravity, the resulting curve is not a parabola, but rather a hyperbolic cosine curve. They're close, but not the same. And using the calculus of variations, you find that this is actually the curve which minimizes potential energy across the cable. You could say this is the curve that, quote, hangs the lowest. If you took every possible curve between the fixed points that had the same length as the cable and found the potential energy at each point and then integrated across the entire thing, you'll find a hyperbolic cosine curve minimizes that value. And that's exactly what nature sometimes likes to do. Nature sometimes likes to minimize things. In fact, if we take this problem up a dimension, we find something similar. If you take a catenary curve, hyperbolic cosine, and rotate it about the x-axis to create a surface, we get something called a catenoid. This is the shape you get if you take two rings, dip them in soap film, and slowly separate them. So why do we get this surface and not like a cylinder? Because again, sometimes nature likes to minimize things. And this catenoid does just that. In fact, it's known as a minimal surface. 
Of the infinitely many surfaces that have these two rings as a boundary, such as this or a cylinder for example, this catenoid here is the one with the minimum surface area. And this is what soap films always do. Whatever your wireframe or boundary, that soap film will take the shape of a minimal surface with that given boundary. The more physical reason for this is this shape, which minimizes surface area, also minimizes elastic energy within the soap film. So it's really energy that nature likes to minimize, just like we saw with the catenary curve. I'll link below this great video on minimal surfaces by the Action Lab, where you can see, like, for a cube boundary, you get something a bit more complicated than you might expect. You don't just get a flat film surface on all six faces, because that doesn't minimize surface area. As you can probably tell already, minimal surfaces are pretty much always strange looking and they're not easy to find. But it's not just soap films where we encounter minimal surfaces, as within the field of material science, all the way to the study of black holes and general relativity, minimal surfaces are an important topic within a variety of branches outside of pure mathematics, but that's all definitely beyond this video. Alright, now moving right along, here's something kind of random that has to do with pursuit curves. Let's say you're standing on land, and you're holding a rigid rod that is connected to something in the water, like, I don't know, maybe some small canoe, which is directly to your right. And while holding that rod, you start to walk forward. What would be the path the canoe takes as you walk? Well, since this has to be mathematically accurate, I found a program online that shows this exact curve, and it looks like this. This curve is known as a tractrix. Wikipedia has an animation showing it being generated when you are both pushing the object and pulling it, but we just saw was only half the curve. I'm not going to go through much of the calculus, but you just need some calc 1 to know how to set up the equation that solves for this curve. Here, I'm going to create the same thing in Desmos where we have the person, the rod of constant length, and the boat. And here you can see the boat move along the tractrix curve as the person walks. But notice at any point on this curve, like this here, the tangent line lies directly on the rod, since the rod is pulling in that direction at that moment. And this will always be the case. So the dy dx at any point is going to be equal to the slope of the rod at that point. To find this, we just need to make a triangle. The hypotenuse is just the length of the rod, so that's a constant, we'll call it L. The base we can just call X, since that length matches the current X coordinate of the boat. And using the Pythagorean theorem, we find the height is root L squared minus X squared. So the slope at this point on the curve where the boat is, or any other point, is going to be rise over run, root L squared minus X squared, all over X but it's purely negative in this case since I'm only considering the top half of the curve where all the tangents have a negative slope. But then all we have to do is solve this differential equation and we get the tractrix equation, which is this here. Now hyperbolic trig comes in because this first term can easily be written in terms of the inverse of hyperbolic secant. We can also parameterize the equation, and if we do so, both the x and y coordinate as a function of time involve regular hyperbolic trig. But here's probably my favorite part of this. Notice that if you find the normal line to this curve at a few points, they don't all intersect at the same location, but they bunch together up here, and as you add more, we see this kind of envelope is created. This is known as the evolute of the tractrix. And that envelope you see in blue is the catenary curve, hyperbolic cosine. That's kind of cool, but there's more. If you take the catenary curve and imagine a string being wrapped around it, the end of that string will trace out a tractrix curve. This is known as the involute of a curve, and when you do the involute, then the evolute, or vice versa, you get the original curve back. I found that kind of cool. Okay, moving on, as I'm sure many of you know, the world map we are very familiar with is very wrong. It doesn't show the proper size of countries, and the distortion gets worse the further away you are from the equator. 
For example, Greenland looks like it's the size of Africa, when in reality, not even close. Over a dozen Greenlands can fit into Africa. This is not the fault of the map makers though, but rather it's the fault of math, as it's mathematically impossible to map something spherical, like the Earth, to a flat surface without distortion. You have to sacrifice something, such as size or angles. It's just like how you cannot wrap a sphere with a piece of paper without that piece of paper crumpling. Whenever you go from flat to spherical, or vice versa, you're going to have distortion. That's because these two objects have different curvature. In fact, there are infinitely many possible world maps, all with different types of distortion. And the different projections have different advantages and disadvantages. The one we're most familiar with is the Mercator projection, and the mathematics of this projection involves hyperbolic trick. It's quite involved, so nothing I'm going to get into, but certain relationships between the location of a point on the globe and its location on the flat map, plus the associated distortion, are calculated with hyperbolic trig functions. The advantage of this map is that, one, it preserves shape very well. Countries on this map are shaped pretty much how they should be. But the biggest thing is this mapping is conformal, meaning it preserves angles and direction. If two roads intersect at some angle on Earth, they'll intersect at that angle on this map. And this makes the map useful in navigation when you're using only a compass. This is the main reason for its creation centuries ago. It was useful for sailors who had to navigate the ocean, the angles on the map translated exactly to the angles they had to follow on a compass. And that conformal mapping or angle slash direction preservation mathematically involves hyperbolic trig. Another application would be that of freefall. The first freefall equation we learn with air resistance is typically one where the force of friction is proportional to velocity. However, in some cases, like larger objects or objects at higher velocities, a better estimate for air friction is that it's proportional to velocity squared, and then we get a different differential equation. And if you look at velocity versus time for case one, when air resistance is proportional to velocity, you get something that looks like a one minus e to the minus x graph that asymptotically approaches terminal velocity. When air resistance is proportional to v squared, you instead get a hyperbolic tangent function, which is very similar, but not quite the same. Now, in reality, they would likely not approach the same terminal velocity, but I just wanted to show how close these curves are without being exactly the same. So, as with this example, just a small change in a differential equation can turn a regular exponential solution into a hyperbolic trig one. Now, there are plenty more examples of hyperbolic trig out there, but what's cool is that just about everything we've discussed so far, from air resistance to pursuit curves to conformal mappings and more, is discussed in much greater detail over at Brilliant, this video sponsor. Everything you're seeing here is actually from their differential equation series, which currently has two full courses which start at the basics and get into plenty of topics that I didn't even cover in college as an engineer but you'll see the calculus involved in equations of pursuit. However, with curves that are much more complicated than the track tricks we saw earlier. And you also see the functions that take planes to spheres in a way that preserves certain characteristics such as angles as the conformal maps did. And you'll even go back to the catenary curve and see why exactly a hanging cable will take the shape of hyperbolic cosine by analyzing both the math and physics of a cable being acted upon by gravity. As you can already see, what's great about Brilliant is the constant visuals, interactive animations, and constant practice problems that help you gain true intuition for even these more advanced topics so you can see exactly how they apply to the world around us. Then those who sign up by using the link below or by going to brilliant.org slash Zachstar will get 20% off their annual premium subscription. And with that, gonna end that video there. Thanks as always to my supporters on Patreon, social media links to follow me are down below, and I'll see you all in the next video.